joining me is the broadcaster and journalist Afwa Hagen and the editor of Spiked Online, Tom Slater. Tom, Afwa, welcome back. Thanks for being with us still. All right, let's start off with the front page of the Sunday People. <laughs> Here's one for you. Rishi in hot water again, Afwa. This is about the Chancellor of the Exchequer, multimillionaire, and his plans for his pool and gym. Just tell us what the people are reporting this morning. Yeah, so, well, m much consternation about Rishi Sunak's plan uh, to build on his £1.5 million estate in North Yorkshire, um, an extension which will include a gym and a, sw a swimming pool. And it's thought that to keep this particular swimming pool that he's proposing to build will cost £13,000 a year, uh, six times perhaps what it costs to heat the average home in the UK since prices were capped at one, about £1,900. So lots of people absolutely furious about this, um, that frankly he can afford it. Now it is seen that he is completely out of touch at a time where we're going through a cost of living crisis. Like I said, energy prices that cap per household at £1,900 a year, people are basically saying the audacity, the audacity that Rishi Sunak would to be proposing to spend so much money on this swimming pool that actually we're not all in this together, that this is another classic case of Tory cronyism, um, that this, this millionaire boys club who do what they want, when they want, break the rules and don't care how it looks to other people. Now, of course, Rishi Sunak isn't breaking any rules by building this swimming pool, but people are saying that basically it is in severe bad taste at a time where the country is going through a cost of living crisis. How dare he build this swimming pool and spend so much money to keep it heated at a balmy 27 degrees all year round. That sounds nice and warm for a swim. I mean, Tom, is, look, this guy is successful. He's made his money. He's done well for himself. Why can't he build himself a pool and a gym and heat it to whatever temperature he likes? Of course, he's at liberty to do that. I think when, when the public is concerned, I don't think the British public in general um, really loathe their leaders if they happen to be rich, even as extremely rich as Rishi Sunak happens to be. I think the question always comes down to that issue of fairness. I think the thing that's really strengthened his reputation, rightly or wrongly, there's different uh, takes on this, is that sense that via his wife's non dom status that he wasn't necessarily, as a family, kind of contributing as much as he should, that there was one rule for, for them and a, another rule for everyone else. I think it's not the wealth that's the issue, really. It's not That's not the thing that makes him care, that's created the sense that he's out of touch. It's that sense in which he's able to kind of operate on a plane and follow certain rules which is just not available to the rest of the people. I think that's the thing that's done it for him, really. Yeah, perhaps. All right, Tom, let's go uh, to the inside pages. Now, you've picked out a story from inside the Sunday Times. This is about the leader of the Labour Party. Let's bring up the, the page there. A nice picture uh, of Sir Keir smiling there. The, what looks like he's in a shop or something, I think. And it says, the headline is questioning if he's going to be able to ever get back uh, the love that Labour has lost. I mean, what does the article say? Does Keir Starmer have the chance? Well, it's actually pouring a bit of cold water on what should be quite a positive time for Keir Starmer. It points out that this time last year, his leadership was kind of hanging by a thread, really. And yet now the, the chances have changed completely in the opposite direction. It's Boris Johnson, whose leadership is in the doldrums. And yet there's still a lot of disquiet within his own party about whether or not he can actually make inroads with the voters he needs to make inroads with. Much of this story is from Labour sources itself, talking about there's a sense that he's still not cutting through with those red wall voters in the north and the Midlands. Um, there's even some disquiet within um, some of the kind of party grandees. There's an interesting news line here about Tony Blair is reportedly dissatisfied not just with Starmer but with much of the shadow cabinet and is working on some sort of alternative cross-party alliance potentially, to, he, some even talking up as a kind of British on marche to try and again kind of take the fight to the Tories but not via the Labour Party. So I think it just really kind of goes to show that as terrible as things are for the Tories right now, they really are terrible in many respects. The issue is again that question of alternatives, Keir Starmer, particularly in the constituencies that he needs to win, just isn't necessarily cutting through at this point. And even if he does win the next election, I think it would be kind of by default really, rather, you know, built on the scandals and the mistakes of his predecessor rather than something that he's genuinely inspiring in people and this piece seems to 
again, give some details about that, really. Yeah, I mean, that cross-party thing has been tried before, hasn't it? Change UK, we all know uh, what happens to that. It didn't change very much. All right, let's, uh, let's keep moving on. Uh, after what, we'll go to the inside pages of the uh, Sunday Mirror. This is a story about um, Prince uh, Harry and uh, a little bit of beef that he's got with his uncle. Tell us about this. Yeah, so this story, uh, talking about Prince Harry's interview that took place this week in The Hague uh, when he was there for the Invictus Games, and it was aired on NBC, and he said in that interview that he had a visit with his grandmother, the Queen, and uh, that they talked about lots of things that only they can talk about, and also uh, he was making sure that she has the right people around her. Now, that statement that he made has driven lots of royal reporters and lots of royal commentators uh, to distraction quite frankly, um, and this take on it is that, he, that he, they think that Prince Harry is furious about Prince Andrew accompanying uh, the Queen at the memorial service for Prince Philip, and that this is a dig at Prince Andrew, and basically Prince Harry is saying that he's not, that Prince Andrew is not the right person to have around his grandmother. Uh, courtiers in the palace are also said to be displeased that perhaps the dig was about them as well. But I just think about these stories that it, it's quite funny to me actually how Prince Harry can sit down and have this interview and talk about the games. Actually, most of the interview was about the games, about his family life um, and about the Queen. He can say a sentence and it can be completely blown up sometimes taken out of context and column inches can be uh, created miles and miles of them out of a statement one little statement that says i'm just making sure i have my grandmother has the right people around her i would love to see what version of it they come up with next week yeah absolutely there'll be something else all right let's let's go on to uh, the final story for this section and this is one that you've picked out tom a uh, fascinating um insight into sort of government plans here. Um, it said that the health secretary, Sajid Javid, is planning a review on the impact of gender dysphoria treatment. Now, just, you have to give us a bit of background, I think, on this story, Tom. How do we get to this point where the health secretary is trying to order a review into um, this kind of treatment? So this is a really important story. So in recent years, there's been a lot of concern about the treatment of children who present with gender dysphoria. Like this is run by something called the Gender Identity um, Service, which is run by the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust. And there's been various people, whistleblowers from within the Tavistock itself, some of which posted in their story, as well as people who have gone through this process, people like Kira Bell, who took Tavistock to court um, over this particular issue because she felt that she was essentially pushed down the road to transition when essentially she was a lesbian, that she felt uncomfortable going through puberty, and that she shouldn't have been affirmed in what she thought was the case, that she was the wrong gender, as it were, when actually it was something that was completely separate. What, what Sajid Javid is doing here, I think, is really important. Fundamentally, he's saying that we need data. We need long-term information as to what happens to these patients, how many of them end up detransitioning, how many of them go on to experience other problems, because... There's clearly an issue here. I mean, in 2009, only 50 children were referred to this service. Last year, it was 2,500, which, unless you believe in the course of the past 10 years, things have overwhelmingly changed in relation to tolerance towards trans people and that people are more open to coming th forward. There could be other explanations here. Again, trans identity issues being read into other problems that young children might have, it being kind of projected onto them. And so I think this is really important. I think and even the kind of reaction that we get from some people even to this, which is basically just a call for open discussion and for more data, I think just shows that with this issue, because it's delicate, because people don't want to be seen to be transphobic, understandably so, they're again letting these things slide. But when you're talking about children going through that most important stage of life, I think we need to be a bit braver and talk about this openly, not to demonise anyone, not to exclude anyone, but to just talk about it. And that's what this review seems to be the beginning of, in my view. Tom Afwa, thank you both very much. Plenty more still to come here on Sky News. Stay with us.